So shalom everyone! Welcome to another vlog by Danny the Digger and this time I'm so super excited to finally make it into the garden tomb. This has been more of a challenge than I thought it would be because due to the pandemic on one hand the site is now open only three hours every day and only five days out of the week and yet when it is open because it's the end we hope of the Omicron wave and maybe finally we're going back to our normal lives there are already some visitors in some groups and you cannot film here when there are groups visiting so I had to come a few times and coordinate a time when it would be open for me but not yet to the public and when I did it for the first time it rained <laughs> but when there's a wheel there's a way and now the Sun is shining and everything is set and you're going to have such a great time because this chapter is actually going to present such a significant site which I used to have a very very specific solid opinion about it. Uh, how, should I say, how should I say a, a critical one? But while preparing for this chapter I was amazed to make some interesting discoveries in literature, in the archaeological research of the site and its environment and realize, oh my god, there is actually a scenario that I'm going to present now for the very first time that might explain, rationalize the plausibility that this is indeed the possible place of the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But let's start with the facts. Let's start first with the old Danny and the rather critical and negative approach toward this site and then the illumination I had by doing some research just before coming here and realizing there is maybe a way to make this a possible location after all. But what are the facts? The facts are that we are right now outside of the city walls and this is an area that was investigated in the 19th century by uh, various scholars. The most famous figure is the American maverick called Edward Robinson. Let me switch to the opposite side and lead you for this beautiful garden today to the most important feature that led people to suggest this might be the place. Okay, now this beautiful serene and spiritual garden seems to be empty but not for too long. I have about 45 minutes, probably just one take, take it or leave it to get this on camera before the groups will start arriving again. But why did this site draw the attention of 19th century scholarship in the first place? Another obstacle I had, by the way, for coming and filming here is the fact that the famous viewpoint of the most significant part was closed for maintenance. That was another delay before I finally got the permit to film here. But that is set too. <laughs> so here we go. They're still, I see, doing some construction work here. I hope it won't be with any noisy machines. As we want to get to this point. This point I have reviewed. This point I have reviewed in the previous chapter when suggesting that this could be the Golgotha and the reason that 19th century indeed 19th century scholarship indeed proposes is because of this feature in the rock actually right now it looks even more convincing it looks like there is an image of a skull there the left eye the right eye and the ridge of the nose that fell apart uh, in 2015. Before that it looked even more convincing. In fact here is an image from the 19th century. Do you see the eyes, the nose ridge and there was even something that looked like a mouthpiece at the bottom which unfortunately today, wait let me switch lenses so you get a better view of this. Unfortunately today the lower part of it is already behind some fence and when I tried filming there I realized it's so filthy I better not show it to the camera and all of this area I must add let me zoom out again is actually part of a 
main bus terminal of East Jerusalem. Yes, the possible site where some believe Jesus was crucified is actually today part of a bus terminal. But who was it the first to propose all of this? It was, first of all, Edward Robinson, which I mentioned before, who surveyed this whole area and noticed that 100 meters in that direction, there are foundations of an ancient wall, an ancient wall. Before his time, scholarship argued that the city today and 2,000 years ago ended right there. Okay, that this is the site of uh, both today's Turkish northern walls as well as the walls of the city. Now, the famous site of the Holy Sepulcher is within city walls, and 19th century scholarship said, well, maybe that cannot be the place because it's within city walls. <clears throat> uh, but on the other hand, that wall may have been added after the time of Jesus. 19th century scholarship, Edward Robinson specifically, finds another wall over there, which means the walls I've I just shown you was built before the time of Jesus, and therefore his tomb cannot be at that location. Okay, now, four years after Robinson publishes the existence of a third wall in that area, a German scholar, Otto Teneus, 1842, says, hey guys, I see a skull shape over here. And if it's a skull-shaped mark in the rock, then maybe this site should be identified with Golgotha. The site of the crucifixion of Jesus is documented in all Gospels as a site whose name is Golgotha, which means in Aramaic, Gulgolet, skull. Skull Hill, Calvary is how some of you know this place. Okay? So, if the tomb of Jesus in the Holy Sepulchre cannot be the location, it's got to be further north, and the crucifixion site, which was right next to it, at least according to the Gospel of John, uh, indicates that it's got to be further north. And this is actually a good location. Okay, you understand the ration? And this was the propose made, and then scholars suggested that the tomb would be nearby, like maybe in this cave or in this cave. And actually, where you have the mosque there, there is a very big size cave that is... Unfortunately, I tried filming there. It's it's used for storage and refrigeration. And when I tried just going in, they screamed and told me to get out of there. So that was an early proposal of the site. But then in 1867, a Greek landlord of this property to the left of the skull-shaped part of the rock, he starts clearing the area. And first of all, he and later scholarship finds indication that there is some good brown soil here, like what you can see also today, which leads all scholars to believe that this may have been a place with a garden. Now that is another very interesting note because the Gospel of John tells us that the crucifixion and the tomb were one next to another and it was within a garden. Gospel of John actually plays a major role in uh, the theory of this site and also in my updated theory. But what really brought the attention to this site is the fact that it's really just a stone throw away from the site of the skull-shaped image in the rock. Along that rock Okay, you see it? Here is that bedrock again. There is a tomb. There is really a tomb carved here in the rock. Oh, I have one kitty visiting. Hello, kitty. Okay, this is the entry. It was later either uh, broken into and, and later covered again, or maybe the original entry was bigger. I think the first scenario is more likely. And inside, there is a tomb. 
here we go. It's actually a tomb with three places to put bodies. And another interesting note, the text tells us that when the Marys came, when uh, they came on the following Sunday to find the tomb is empty, they did see an angel actually sitting inside telling them why the body is not there because he has risen. But the text tells us that they saw him sitting on the right side. And both in the Holy Sepulchre and here, indeed, the burials are on the right side. Isn't that interesting? So in the 1880s, a colorful character called Charles Gordon, he was the one to say, hey, this could be the place. He was a famous figure, a general also, and he was the one to advocate, to promote the notion that this could be the alternative site and the next thing you know is the whole area was purchased and maintained to this day by an organization called the Garden Tomb. Okay, it all, you know, th these are basic, uh, basic information about the history of the place. Everyone knows it, but what some of you may not be aware of is the fact that in the 1980s archaeology started questioning the authenticity of the site and there are two maybe three problems first of all wait let me switch first of all unlike the the church of the holy sepulcher this site is not known by any historical sources no one suggested in the past there's no old tradition about this location at least not that we are familiar with furthermore the the rock formation like what you see over here, who knows if it's ancient? Maybe that skull-shaped feature uh, uh, was formed by accident in the 19th century in some quarrying activity. We know for a fact that the Ottomans have quarried inside Sedekaya's cave, which I presented in my previous chapter, which is just next to it. They made some massive quarrying activity there to make a fanciful clock tower over Jaffa Gate. Later, the British thought it was so ugly and inappropriate, they knocked it down. But there was quarrying activity both in the today's bus terminal and in Sedekai's cave. So there is seemingly a shape of a skull there, but is it really ancient? And the worst problem, let me again go into the cave. The worst problem here is that the shape of the cave is not, is not typical to the first temple, to the second temple period, to the time of Jesus. Okay, now the text tells us clearly that Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in a new tomb. A new tomb, it even says that no one has used before. But this tomb, studied by archaeologists, is clearly a tomb that was originally formed in the first temple period seven or eight hundred years earlier and in fact it was also used centuries after the time of Jesus in the in the first temple period the dead would be put on benches but in the Byzantine period they were more commonly putting their dead in trough shaped kind of um, marks and it is also the red cross painting which was found here in the 19th century which is typical to the Byzantine period. So this led archaeologists to suggest that with all respect to the 19th century tradition developing here, that actually the tomb predates the time of Jesus by several centuries and was also used again in the following centuries, in the Byzantine and even in the Crusader times. In fact, this mark on the floor here which many tend to think is for the big round rolling stone that was used to seal the tomb. No, they suggest it was a trough of a stable from the time of the Crusaders. And the big stone that is presented right opposite, right here, and, and visitors think, oh, this is the stone used for the rolling of the tomb. It's not from here. It was brought from a different location in Jerusalem. Okay, so the archaeological facts are very important 
and again for many years for respect to the spirituality and this is a very special and spiritual place I admit the data doesn't seem to match and the guides here are also very very careful to say you know we don't know really if this is the place it's a great place to demonstrate the, the passion of Christ what he has witnessed through but to say that this is the actual spot now right there they're very careful of, of not stating that because they know that the archaeological data uh, is let's say a bit problematic however however when preparing for this vlog I connected the dots of the archaeological information we have also from the perimeter of this site. And when I mean perimeter, I mean a specific compound just behind the tomb inside the garden tomb, which I knew its details, but only recently did I connect a possible scenario that would rationalize the whole thing. Okay, but to show you the neighbors, we need to go out. Wait, don't close the door. Keep it open, thank you. Leave, leave the door open, okay? okay? I'm just going out here. <laughs> if, if he locks, it's a mess. Uh, okay, this wall is actually another compound that was purchased in the 1880s by French Benedictines who wanted to restore a big compound known there from the Byzantine period. A big compound originally built by the Empress Evdokia to honor Stephanus. The bones of Stephanus were found uh, in the 5th century and were brought to Jerusalem and, and there was a giant church here to present the relics of Stephanus. But it went out of use and in the 19th century there were plans to uh, reclaim the property, restore the church, and they have done so. There is a very nice Saint Etienne church inside. But what very few people know is that in the plot at the western edge, and I'm gonna now make an attempt to get a photo of this. There we go. In the plot at the eastern edge, I'm sorry, the eastern edge of this site, they actually found a tomb complex and a very big one. Okay, I don't want to risk the, both the gear and the neighbors yelling at me, so I just had a quick peek of it. But I hope you notice that there was a cement floor uh, in front of the camera there. That cement floor is actually the ceiling. Wait, let me quickly get back in before someone closes the door uh, that ceiling that floor is the ceiling of a 2,700 year old tomb complex which was a total surprise when they found it and more than this okay. and more than this the tomb is actually a grand tomb. It's two very big caves with uh, uh, large rooms in size, inside. The interior was all looted, so there's no way of telling uh, who was buried there by any of the finds. Unfortunately, there were also no inscriptions. However, the size of it, the, the grandeur of it, seems to indicate this is very high class of the time of the first temple of Jerusalem, of Biblical Jerusalem, of Old Testament Jerusalem. And the two alternatives is either these are the high priests or the priests or royalty. Now at first hand you can rule out royalty because the Bible tells us clearly that David and the, the kings that followed him were all buried in the city of David. And in the past, they thought City of David is the Tower of David, Jaffa Gate. We now know it's not there. The, the City of David is actually in underneath the Arab village of Silwan, the area of the Gihon Spring, the Pool of Siloam. I have viewed the Pool of Siloam at least in one of my previous chapters. <laughs> I'm getting excited when I'm getting to the punchline now. But we know from the Bible that there was one king 
who wasn't buried there. We know that one king actually ended up his life in isolation and that's also where he was buried. I'm talking about King Uzziah. King Uzziah reigned for quite a few years, for 52 years, but there was one problem with his reign. He had leprosy. So the Bible tells us that once he became a leper, he was excommunicated. Maybe he continued to be the king, but he lived in isolation. And Josephus tells us centuries later that he ended up dying and buried in that place, which he labels as in his gardens. Now that is quite interesting because it seems to indicate that Uzziah was isolated but being a king he was given a nice grand place with gardens and that's also where he was buried. And that is actually how Assyrians would build their palaces and Assyrians were the dominating culture and power and we know from archaeology in general there's quite a lot of influence from Assyrian culture at the time. Do you see which way I'm going? <laughs> So, it wasn't just me, it was also other scholars who suggested that the royal tombs over there are actually of the last kings of Judea. The Bible tells us that after Uzziah, at least two kings were buried, listen carefully, in the garden of Uzzah. Uzzah is another name for Uzziah. Okay, now let's start connecting all the dots. In my humble opinion, Uzziah was a king but also a leper so he was sent away to a hill overlooking biblical Jerusalem where he was buried he was isolated but in a nice place with a nice view and nice gardens once there was a tomb installed for that king his successors were also buried in that tomb until the Babylonian destruction of the city now here's the amazing amazing archaeological fact the royal tombs inside the Saint Etienne compound are actually, if you put them on a map, just behind that wall and more, they are parallel. They are identical, identically parallel to this tomb. So you know what I think? I think that originally this was the tomb of King Uzziah. And the, and the following kings were buried next to him, not with him because he was a leper, no one wanted to be buried in a tomb of a leper, fearing he might be infected. But next to the, you know, the, the, the parent, the grandparent, or so on. So that's one startling conclusion I reached. But how do you connect it to the possibility that Jesus was buried here? The key figure for this part is the guy who buried him, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. First of all, where is Arimathea? And the answer is no one knows. There is no place name given by Josephus, the Mishnah, or anyone else called Arimathea. But if you drop the A, and A can sometimes be added, like Harama, Habika, Hahar, then you are left with Ramata or Ramitea. And that could be a longer extension, Greek or version word for the place name of Rama. Now, do you know who lived in Ramah in biblical times? Samuel, Prophet Samuel. And what was the role of Prophet Samuel in the Bible? He had a critical role. He was actually the one to choose between Saul and David and favored David to crown him to form David as king in the Davidic dynasty. He was like part of a heavenly plan. And he was from Ramah. Rama is now identified almost by all scholars as a hilltop, a beautiful hilltop, about six miles northwest uh, of Jerusalem. So in my humble opinion, Joseph of Arimathea was also from Rama, and Joseph of Rama was also playing a major role in the heavenly plan. And the heavenly plan was that the tomb once used for the burial of a king, but a rejected king, would now be used again for the burial of another king, the person bearing, bringing the kingdom of heaven, but also a person that was again despised, rejected, 
okay, and, and confirming what the prophet Samuel tells us, that the Messiah will be nivzevechadalishim, rejected, and I don't know the English words for this, isolated and rejected by, by his own people. Okay? I think that Joseph of Arimathea may have been the person that was led by the heavenly plan to use the same tomb of Uziah for the burial of Jesus. But wait, how could he do it if this was already in use? Well, we know another amazing archaeological fact that the bones of King Uziah were removed at some point of time. We know so <clears throat> because we found a tombstone. It was found in the early 20th century on Mount of Olives. An Aramaic inscription says, Lecha hatat atzmot Uziah melech vela lemafteach. To here were brought the bones of King Uziah and do not open. Now, it's not the tomb. It's just like the, the inscription at the entrance. But it clarifies two things. A, <clears throat> Uziah's tomb was known also centuries later, and the style of the letter is around the first century. And secondly, we know that the bones were removed from the original location to another one, which I don't know where it is. Maybe on Mount of Olives, because that's where that stone was found. But who knows? What am I suggesting? Joseph of Arimathea knowing that he has to prepare now as coming from the home of a biblical prophet he has to prepare now a place for the barrier of kingdom of heaven he has to prepare the tomb of the biblical king for this so he was the one to come to the tomb of Uziah take the bones elsewhere bury them properly in a dignified way in a new location the, the tombstone inscription indicates it and now this place is ready. Now this place is ready and settled for the new despised king, if you wish. That combination of being both king, related to kingdom, and kingdom of heaven, and yet being despised and isolated. Okay? I was amazed when it hit me that you could connect the archaeological finds from different locations, both around the corner, both from Mount of Olives, and, and make this suggestion. But there is one word that is still a bit confusing. The word is new. The text tells us in all Gospels that <clears throat> uh, this was a new tomb, that no one has been buried in it yet before. But as I've shown you already a few times, this tomb in its style actually dates to the first temple period reused again in the Byzantine period. Okay? I think that Joseph in this case simply uh, told the family this is a new tomb when he knew it was not. Why did he do so? Because he knew this is all part of the heavenly plan. Okay? But he didn't want the family coming from the galley not knowing the the, the environment of Jerusalem well enough uh, that if, if they knew that this is a tomb of already used, they will reject using it. But not being locals, he thought that if he would state this is a new tomb, it would work. Does it make sense? To me it makes sense. Can I prove it? Of course not. But I will point to an interesting note. If he did try to claim to the family that this was indeed a new tomb, I think they were not convinced. I think they heard of the rumor that this might have been a used tomb because the fact is, and I checked it, all Gospels tells us that when the actual burial took place, it was done only by him. It seems that the family were aware of the fact maybe that this was once the tomb of a leper king, and even centuries later, no one wants to take the risk of, of catching leprosy. So he did end up bearing Jesus by himself. But that rationalizes why he stated, and it's recorded always, as a new tomb. People, I know there are you know, several speculations here. But it makes sense. It just, as 
is a possible scenario. Of course, I cannot prove it. You know what? I cannot prove any of the sites that I'm presenting in this vlog. I'm only presenting the scripture, the archaeological evidence, and, you know, making educated guesses. And I was amazed when I was preparing for this and, and reaching a conclusion that this actually might be the true site after all. Maybe, maybe not. But you know what? Let's stroll again through the garden to show you that in any case, this place is so beautiful, so serene, and so spiritual. And I really don't have much more time. I can hear already people coming. Oh, the staff has arrived. That means they're about to open any minute. So let me just find a nice, quiet place to end this beautiful and remarkable place. This site, to conclude, contains some very intriguing archaeological evidence that could be, could be, at the end of the day, linked to the crucifixion and burial, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And today, it also delivers a really unique atmosphere here in Jerusalem, just around the corner. You saw before how busy and dirty and polluted it is. And yet, how do you explain it that right next to it, such a serene, such a spiritual place. Maybe this is also part of some heavenly plan to enable the visitors to come here and to feel in their spirit the passion of Jesus. What a remarkable place. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. This was really been exciting and emotional journey for me, I must say. These are emotional days, vlogging this and also still coping with the pandemic, still recovering from my own uh, infection. Um, the next chapters are going to be following the aftermath of the resurrection. Jesus actually gets the hell out of Jerusalem. He goes back to the galley, but the Gospel of Luke tells us that he appears at a site called Emmaus. Emmaus. Where is that site? It's more complicated than you think. There are actually a few candidates for that location. And so I'm going to review these uh, spots. And uh, of course, I thank you all so much for all of the viewers, commentators. I love reading the feedback. I'm so, so overwhelmed by those supporting me. This is really, really appreciated in those days. Also to improve my gear, but also to uh, help pay the bills and give me the incentive to continue. Todaraba. Thank you all. Thank you all for watching. God bless you. And until the next vlog, let's